Well, let's go ahead and get started. Happy Friday, everybody. Um, glad you all can be here. Uh, my name is Adrian Wren. I'm a project leader at Valley Vision, and I'm staffed to the Sacramento Region's Cleaner Air Partnership Coalition. So welcome, welcome. Um, really pleased to see you all uh, interested in coordinating around several of these upcoming federal and state funding programs to improve transportation, mobility, air quality, and more. Uh, again, this is the first virtual capital engine of 2022. Um, and and these, these investments include this, both the State Community and Economic Resilience Fund, or SURF, as well as the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA. Um, so just to better understand who's in today's meeting, please enter your name and your affiliation in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. First name, last name, affiliation, if possible. And while you're doing that, I can just provide a little bit of background for those who are new to Cleaner Air Partnership events. Um, CAP, as we call it, was created all the way back in 1986 by the Sacramento Metro Chamber and Breathe California Sacramento Region. Uh, Valley Vision began to manage it about 15 years ago. It's currently a broad-based partnership which includes business leaders, environmental advocates, public health nonprofits, and our region's five air quality management districts, uh, all working together to help the six-county Sacramento region protect public health and promote economic growth by advocating for cleaner air. A big thank you to our event sponsors, the Sac Metro Air District, Tykert, SMUD, Sutter Health, Union Pacific, the Sacramento Association of Realtors, the Placer County Air Pollution Control District, the Yola Solano Air Quality Management District, El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, the North State BIA, PG&E, CEMEX, and the Healthy Air Alliance. A bit of housekeeping before we dive in, this meeting is being recorded and a link will be shared with you all early next week. Uh, you can always find recordings of Valley Vision hosted events and cleaner air partnership events on our YouTube channel. And as you've likely noticed, this is a, a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar in order to be more interactive for all of us. If you have questions you'd like to verbalize, please use the raise hand function. Depending on your version of Zoom, it's either under the participants button or the reactions button. And those of you on mobile devices, on iPhone or Android also have this option. And then those of you calling in, I'm not sure if we have anyone calling in right now, uh, you can dial star nine to raise or lower your hand and star six to mute or unmute yourself. And of course, there's also a chat box for comments and I'll regular el regularly elevate questions from the chat. So I'd like to introduce Brittany Johnson. She's a Valley Vision Executive Associate supporting our CEO, Evan Schmidt, and projects in our leadership and civic engagement impact area. Brittany is going to be running the back end. Uh, Brittany, would you like to say hi? Hello. I'm glad to be here. Glad to help out. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. So now we're going to uh, begin with a little bit of an icebreaker. We do these at all of our CAP luncheons, as folks will recall. These are these fun Zoom polls that we take full advantage of uh, at each of these events. So I'm going to launch a poll right now. Thanks, Brittany. Um, let's launch this. So daylight savings time, yes or no? Uh, we're coming up on another round of daylight savings. I believe March 9th. I, I forget the exact date, but we're coming up. We're coming up on it. And commonly referred to as the bad one, this is the one where you actually lose an hour of sleep. There are a lot of folks who, who like it, though. They say you get more, more time in the afternoon, more daylight, I should say, in the afternoon. So be that as it may, um, I'm going to give you guys five more seconds to respond, and then I'm going to share the results, okay? Three, two, one. Share those results. So hopefully folks can see that. It's pretty close. 54% like daylight savings time or are at least willing to accommodate it. 46% say no. So for those of you who say no, there's always Arizona waiting for you. I understand that the state of Arizona doesn't have daylight savings time, so good stuff. All right. Thanks all for participating in that. <laughs> so uh, now let's dive into our subject matter. Uh, we're going to talk today about coordinating around several upcoming federal and state funding programs to improve mobility and air quality. So we have some several experts with us today who look forward to exploring this topic and answering your questions. They are Bill Boyce with SMUD, Rafe Porter with the SAC Metro Air District, and Chris Flores with the Sacramento Regional Transit District, or SAC-RT. Uh, and just as a little bit of background before I hand it over to them, uh, that the four agency collaborative of SMUD, the Air District, SAC-RT, and SACOG, or the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, those four agencies have been collaborating for some time now to develop joint priorities and to build public sector alignment in the interest of preparing our region for forthcoming investment. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to our speakers who can start by 
sharing a little bit about their background, a little bit about themselves, and then they can begin talking about their recent efforts. So uh, I'm gonna, who would like to go first between the three of you? <laughs> I'll go ahead. Go for um, it. So hi everyone, um, and thanks for having us here. Uh, happy to be chatting and, and happy to be partnering with SACRT, SMUD, and, and SACOG on this effort. Uh, really, I guess from our perspective, we were looking at you know close to seventy billion dollars between federal and and state um, dollars coming down, uh, and looking at our region, uh, we knew that we had uh, goals that were aligned, but it was how we really move there. And uh, SMUD did a great job of of kind of pulling us all together to say let's make sure that that um, that we're aligned not just from a policy perspective, but what we really want for our region as it relates to, to these infrastructure packages um, coming down the pipe. So um, we all kind of rolled up our sleeves, spent lots and lots of hours working on trying to figure out what are the, the things that we really need to do um, and where we already have a lot of efforts underway and how can we capitalize on those. So we put together this um, regional um, EV strategy uh, to, to kind of outline that, and it, it jumps into a few areas, and, and you know, we'll I'll touch on a on a few, and like Chris and, and Bill um, jump on the on, on a few of the other ones. From our perspective, one of the the things that we were looking at, um, and this is following up with a lot of the work that we have underway up in North Sacramento with the Del Paso Heights Mobility Hub was just that, of, of where are there areas in our region that um, are mobility deserts, that people don't have um, good, safe, clean access to good, safe, clean mobility options. And that's exactly what we're trying to do um, in that mobility hub up in North Sacramento. And, and this is, we're not working alone. This is a, a very community-based project. We're working with Green Tech, we're working with SMUD, um, we're working with the city, we're working with a lot of partners on, on trying to, to bring this mobility hub there. And we're looking at the success of that and we're looking at the challenges that we've had and, and lots of lessons learned and looking at where we could put that. So I think we've got um, 27 mobility hubs identified in Sacramento County and another 25 throughout the rest of the SACOG region. Um, and so that's one of the, that's one of the areas that, that, that we're seeing a, a lot of potential. We know we're not alone there. We, we're um, constantly having conversations with many of you on, on this call um, about how, how can we um, better support that, whether it's, you know, we are able to align for these federal and state dollars, or again, with the projects we are, already have um, underway, how can we really push on that? I think taking a step back, what we're really most excited about with this is just the partnership that this brings. Obviously, we've worked with SMUD, we've worked with RT, we've worked with SACOG before, but um, to actually do it in, in, a, in a formal formal and organized manner to making sure that, that we're all truly working towards the same thing is, has been fantastic. Um, and uh, whether we're successful on this or not, which um, I'm pretty confident we will be, I think it's just a great step for our region in, in, in moving in this collaborative way. Um, so I will stop there and, and turn it over to Chris and Bill and, and see what they want to add and, and want to turn it and want to actually just have this be more of a conversation. So any questions and comments people have. So yeah, Chris no. and Bill, take it away. Awesome, Grace. And I, I really appreciate you setting the stage there and, and, and for Valley Vision and Clear our partnership for um, hosting us today and, and this platform, because this is such an important issue. I know, um, obviously, you know, our region is dominated by... Um, greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. So what we can do to really kind of make a shift in that is, is vital. And, and so I'll just add this, this didn't just happen. This has been um, a long time partnership between these four agencies that actually, when um, Dr. Ayala and Henry and James Corliss all started at CEOs, kind of about 2015, 2016 timeframe at, at the respective agencies, they, they saw a shared vision and started meeting on a regular basis. and. Um, we added SMUD knowing there's, uh, that's how important they are to this process. And so that those meetings happen on a monthly basis at the CEO level, at the staff level. And so there's just a lot of collaboration happening and, and really um, we have a tremendous task ahead of us. So um, I just wanna share a little bit of perspective. And as I said, Rafe 
as Ray said, let's kind of have this more of a discussion, but a little bit perspective from SACRT. And I'll go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Um, let's see. Please. And so on Monday, um, SACRT will be presenting our zero. Let me know. Can you see this? I'm not, yes, I don't use great. Zoom very often. Sorry. Okay. Looks, thank looks you. Looks great. Um, so we'll be presenting our zero emission vehicle transition um, plan phase two. And really, um, by way of background, the California Resources Board adopted a regulation in December 2018 that requires all um, transit agencies to develop a transition plan for zero emission fleet um, with basically transitioning all of their fleet, um, big bus, small bus, to uh, zero emission by 2040. And um, in fact, by uh, 2030, we can exclusively buy zero emission vehicles. So we've um, submitted our rollout plan back in October 2020, and um, we've been working to implement, and we're, um, we'll be presenting phase two to our board, as I mentioned, a little bit more refined work, and, and I'll, I'll put the board package in, uh, in a little bit um, so you guys can see the, the full board presentation on this, but kind of the package um, that was put together kind of just a little bit about our fleet, the background on SACRT, some various concepts. Um, we're looking at probably needing at least three bus yards to serve, um, effectively serve the Sacramento community. And so strategically locating um, some of those in the north, south area um, and, and east as well. And then kind of our proposed construction for, for as we transition the various costs related to it and kind of next steps. Um, so certainly facilities planning, as I mentioned, we'll be looking for at various technologies, um, electric and hydrogen and, um, how we transition from our, our current fleet of uh, CNG um, buses. And so just a little bit um, further background, you'll see James Boyle, Director of Planning, make this presentation on Monday. Um, but we have about 500 plus buses in our current fleet. Um, 24 are electric currently, um, but the 500 is a, a combination of 40 foot big buses and then a number of cutaway um, paratransit buses, um, if you will. So. Overall, we're estimating this could cost about, you know, $500, $600 million as we make this transition over the years. So um, certainly uh, quite, a, quite an endeavor, but as we mentioned with the, the um, additional funding from the um, bipartisan infrastructure law um, in a five-year plan that really, um, it really increases um, funding for transportation for transit agencies to about 40% in formula, and then there's 35, 40% in the competitive area. So some great opportunities to really um, snag some federal dollars and, and so forth. So um, just wanted to make that presentation and I'll, I'll let Bill um, go ahead next and then I think we'll, we'll turn it over to questions and comments. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Bill Boyce with SMUD and I'm a, a electric transportation strategic planning and policy. Uh, subject matter expert. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen as well because I'll just kind of fill out the picture uh, from what uh, both Chris and um, uh, Rafe kind of covered already. And I can't tell if you can see that screen or not. Um, but with regards to the overall transportation scene, in the bigger scheme of things, everything's headed towards zero emission vehicles. And either if that's electric or hydrogen, uh, of course, if it's using electricity, that's directly from the grid in most cases, or hydrogen, even the hydrogen um, fueling still uses a lot of electricity and a lot of the processes either in uh, generating the hydrogen from electrolysis or in the uh, uh, compression phases, you've got to pump that up. Uh, most of that uses electric uh, electric um, compressor. So electricity starts to play a big role in all of this. And so uh, we've been paying attention to all of this for a long time. SMUD's had a electric transportation group since 1990. So literally thinking about that, we've been studying electricity as a transportation fuel for over 30 years. So kind of bringing those skill sets to support things. Um, you know, going through the, the charts, Chris already touched on this one. Uh, one of the things we recognized across the board is really public fleet electrification with regards to a lot of the big transit bus fleets. 
um, not only RT, but you know the surrounding uh, areas. SMUD's actually been working on a uh, what we call a medium and heavy duty blueprint grant we got from the California Energy Commission last year. A lot of that was in cooperation with the partners on this call um, uh, with regards to SMA QMD and SACOG. Um, working a lot in planning with regional transit, school districts, and others. But a lot of that all feeds into some of these bigger things that we anticipate going after funding. It's going to take a lot of effort to go get $500 million. If you think about it, that's not just a casual little endeavor to go try and get that much money. So uh, pooling our resources and coordination um, is going to be important. Um, Rafe kind of touched on this, uh, equity communities. We need a lot of support. Um, he kind of talked about the charging deserts at SMUD. We've got a map where we look at the uh, impacted under-resourced communities. We actually have a sustainable communities index map. Um, some other folks from SMUD, such as Jose, might have already um, covered this in the past, but I take this map and I go in and, and I plot chargers on this map. And then I take a look at where there's deserts. And this is where uh, Rafe kind of talked about, you know, trying to get things in, um, you know, Del Paso, North Highlands. How do you get things out in South Sacramento? How do we get things where um, maybe it's a little bit uh, rural, but you don't have any uh, charging there? So a lot of that, it takes a look at, you know, where are we in need of charging? Where are we in need in just transportation solutions themselves? It's not just about electric vehicles. It's about getting the vehicles in there. It's about getting the charging. It's about getting other options such as, um, you know, more active transportation or e-bikes, um, ride share, share cars, uh, just getting transportation assets in general, but really paying attention to that. Um, lastly, or not actually second to last, uh, what we see in the EV world, I mean, most people, electric vehicles, you know, the light duty vehicles are here. Um, I can tell you we're up to about 23,500 uh, light duty electric vehicles in Sacramento County right now. Um, when you add the six county region around Sacramento, you can usually about double that. So in the region, we're probably upwards of about 50,000 right now. Um, but the next thing that we're all getting imposed and impacted on is really medium and heavy duty. And when you start thinking about that, you start thinking about goods movement. Um, these charging assets have to be a lot bigger. And so there's a lot of planning going on and how are we going to support goods movement up and down the state? Um, and this just kind of gives you a, a study uh, results from uh, uh, basically a study from a couple of years ago called the West Coast Clean Transit Corridor Initiative. I don't spell that out because it takes half the page by itself, but um, you can just get a sense of what the planning is now going uh, to start looking like as we start building out beyond light duty vehicles. Um, and SACOG has actually been looking at this a lot with regards to uh, trip planning, uh, where do the trucks park each night? Uh, that's in combination with the uh, Caltrans, but a lot of the long-term EV planning is now headed towards how do we support medium and heavy duty vehicles. And lastly, um, if you talk to anybody in the zero emission vehicle transportation space, um, one of the things that everything is hurting for workforce, we need skilled workers. We need people with these skills. Um, one of the initiatives that we've got on this is we really need to get more workforce developed. There's a lot of uh, activity starting to happen in this, but this is also a chance to really also address some of the other issues in our community. Which we'd love for these jobs to come from um, the under-resourced communities. Uh, how can we get um, this opportunity of this total retooling of our transportation system 
to create new jobs for uh, people in uh, low income dis um, distressed communities, under resourced, um, to really bring up the standard of living and uh, uh, quality of life at the same time that we're addressing air quality. So these were the big four initiatives that the um, four agencies really came up with. And um, you know, pushing for money to really support that across the board is what we've been striving for. And that kind of does it for us. Thanks for that. That was really informative. And particularly the, I mean, just looking at the map of Sacramento County and seeing sort of the red zones where there are not there's not a lot of infrastructure. I think that's really telling in terms of guiding future investment, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, I'll go ahead and bring that back up. You know, that's really, um, you know, with regards to, uh, you know, everything we do now, I'll just say when I am handed a, a, a charging project, very first thing I do is I go check where it falls on this map. And, uh, you know, the other important thing to consider is there's actually different funding opportunities if you're in a designated zone, like we know. And so, you know, not only is it just uh, where do we need stuff, but this also starts to bring into play additional resources we can get to uh, get infrastructure in those areas. So um, very, very important with regards to, you know, how do we get things funded? Um, how do we meet the needs of our community and, and how do we address the community needs for um, everybody to, you know, like I said, improve quality of life, economics, and air quality all at the same time? Got it. Yeah, well, this is, this is really good and helpful in terms of just pre-work, uh, pre-work among the four agencies to ensure that we're, we're prepared <laughs> for, for a lot of the investments that are coming our way. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question, then turn it over to Jeffrey and then Alberto. Um, uh, and and my question was really just around. I think your your second slide, Bill, was you quoted a five hundred million dollar figure for fleet electrification. Uh, is that just Sac County and Smud Service Territory? Or is that the whole six county region? Uh, that was the whole six county region. So it looked at you know charging from the satellite transportation agencies that you know, move into Sacramento. I think one of the things that we talked about is the fact that RT, you know, there's a lot of uh, transit agencies that come into Sacramento to drop off workers. A lot of those buses park all day long downtown places or out at some place like McClellan. And then they go back into downtown Sacramento to pick workers up and go back out into the surrounding counties. So, you know, we're looking at charging assets um, that can be used um, across the board to be able to support the region with regards to those types of uh, zero emission vehicles. Got it. Chris, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, no, I, thank you, Bill. I was gonna add on that, that, that we're always looking at how we can integrate with the regional services and have, you know, share some of this infrastructure and make sure it's it's really being used to its its full capacity. I mean, when buses are out, out on system, we have, you know, have the ability to charge and, and, and share those. So yeah, thank you, Bill. I'd like to turn it over to the folks with hand raises. Again, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, Jeffrey, then Alberto. Um, I'm gonna start with Smudge. Uh, my understanding, are you considering about 15 miles is where a reliable charging station needs to be placed? And is it a true statement that you need to increase by at least 50% for the purpose of electrification for charging for vehicles? And what is the likelihood? Um, so far, I, I, I hear or see it in the city. How many are either county or designed for a freeway access? Uh, that's my question for SMED to Chris at RT. My question is going to be about where in the north area do you consider a transportation hub? And is it in the five-year plan that's out there um, going on right now? So is the hospital over in um, the rail yards going to be considered a charging and a hub? 
and where north of it is that next set of hospitals being built at the old arena site, is that going to be something that's going to be within the five-year plan or is it beyond that period? And I'll stop right there with, I think that's enough question. Bill, did you capture Jeffrey's question? I'm not quite sure I quite understand the question, but um, you mentioned every 15 miles, um, um, you know, there's a big difference of how vehicles charge depending on if it's kind of light duty from residential versus medium and heavy duty. Uh, what we actually find in electric vehicles is a majority of people charge their vehicles at home or at their business. And so um, actually that's where about 80% of the charging comes out to be. So when we start planning um, planning public charging, um, you know, there's different aspects of what, I don't think we have a set every 15 miles. Um, for that one study we did for the West Coast that was trying to get charging about every 50 miles. Um, and uh, looking at, you know, truck stops and, and how they play out with regards to long distance travel where you might not have a business. But, um, you know, I can tell you some of the other studies we look at is really to address light duty range anxiety is, you know, charging much more available, um, you know, every four miles or something of that nature, almost in a grid. But um, like I said, a majority of people charge at home or at a depot and the long distance travel, that map um, was about every 50 miles. Thank you. And Chris, uh, I think Jeffrey also had a question for you. So if you could speak on that and then I'm gonna get through the rest of the hands and then we'll gonna shift over to talking about the State uh, Community Economic Resilience Fund coordination. Then we'll have more discussion after that, okay? So, Chris. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, so I think Jeff talked about connections to the two hospitals that are being planned, um, the Kaiser facility and the rail yards, and then also um, the Cal North State University over at the um, former, former ARCO site. Um, we have been talking with the city about integration within the rail yards as it gets built out and various routing on that. So as that, that gets built out, we certainly will be serving it. In terms of the hospital and the arena, um, I think, you know, we have the green line proposed there that would, would certainly um, connect there. And with the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're, we're looking for more funding and, and certainly uh, um, we are updating our short range transit plan right now. So certain that's a five year lookout. So um, as these get built out that we get update that every five years, um, certainly look to incorporate service to, to where it's needed. Thanks, Chris. Um, go to Alberto, then Susan. Thank you, um, Adrian. Uh, and first of all, I want to thank our, our esteemed colleagues for a great presentation. I want to acknowledge that um, um, just because they're not part of the panel, uh, SACOG has been a critical partner. So I just want to emphasize that we could not do what we're doing without their, their participation and contribution and, and leadership for that matter. But I wanted to ask uh, the panel a question. I noticed in Chris's uh, presentation that um, Sacramento RT is actually contemplating or at least leaving the door open for fuel cell electric buses and the use of hydrogen. So I wanted to ask our panel if you can provide your perspective in terms of what do you see the potential for the other electric vehicles, the fuel cells uh, with hydrogen, uh, particularly in the area that is the most challenging that Bill spoke about, the big, uh, freight vehicles, the, you know, the big rigs, the trucks, uh, and even even bigger locomotives and other applications. I wonder if you guys can uh, provide some comments. I'll go ahead and start and then, and then let Chris jump in on the, on the transit side. We hear from both the vehicle manufacturers as well as the fleets that it's not a one size fits all solution, that we're really going to need to be somewhat technology agnostic, if you will, and one, let the market decide, but two, there's gonna, the different technologies apply a, a little bit differently. Um, for example, in, in the foothills, hydrogen might be a, a little bit better where, you know, running shorter distances 
in downtown Sacramento, electrification might be the better solution. Um, while we're hearing that hydrogen might be the best solution for, for bigger and longer haul trucks, um, we know that we're having conversations with a lot of EV providers as well on, in that space. So um, while, you know, while we as the Air District are, are again, being agnostic and, and fully supportive of, of both, we're going to let a little bit the market decide. But we also, um, being a public agency, we want to not hamstring, I guess, if you will, any technologies too. That sometimes it does take that public investment in order to get the market to, to, to actually bear on that. And so we are hearing from some of our Again, especially on the fleet side, that you know it's a little bit of a if if you if you build it, they will come mentality. That if that infrastructure is in place, they will consider that technology. So if if we have the appropriate um, hydrogen fueling stations, for example, the fleets would consider that. Um, I don't know from the from the RT or the transit side um, if that's the case, but we, we are hearing from a lot of the the trucking companies that's that's the case. So so. Absolutely, it's a it's a viable it's a viable technology. Things are going to be moving that direction. If I think of you know take a step back and think about the scoping plan, I think they had early adoption for EV and then hydrogen kind of being more of the outlier as we move to zero emission vehicles. And I think we're probably seeing that um, kind of play out at least how we look at it from our funding round perspective. Chris, I don't know if you yeah. want to add anything from the transit side. Yeah, thank you. And I'm certainly not a technology expert, but I think what you said is exactly right. I think as we adapt to technology and, and, and look at it, we're, we're kind of agnostic and as we develop until we we've truly make that uh, leap, but it, may, it could be a combination of them. I mean, we know AC Transit, we've toured their uh, hydrogen fleet down there, but you know, we're anticipating as we convert, if it goes electric, that we may need more buses because of lack of range. So if hydrogen can fill that in there, and then we're always at the cutaway, the smaller buses, we haven't found a great um, zero emission bus that we love. So if there's, you know, as the technology catches up, we're, we're looking. And so any support we can get to, to on those always. But thank you. I think Dr. Ayala probably knows the technology better than I, though. Yeah, from the electricity side, I can tell you, um, you know, the, the technology uh, evolvement on the electricity side is increasing very, very quickly. You know, there's initiatives ongoing now to charge trucks at a really high rate to be able to essentially give people charging times in the uh, 10, 20 minute time frame. From an electrical load perspective, that's going to be really uh, challenging on the grid side, but it just shows you where the technology is already headed, a lot of breakthroughs on battery. Um, but I agree with Rafe. I mean, when I look at the, the trade studies, you know, hydrogen has its place in, in the really heavy vehicles, um, you know, but honestly, I also think it's going to be a race on infrastructure. Um, unlike light duty vehicles where, you know, you can plug into a 120 volt outlet to get started, you don't have to have uh, a charger. I mean, uh, the cars come with that ability to at least get you uh, to move. We can't do that with the medium and heavy duty vehicles and goods movement. The refueling infrastructure needs to be in the ground before the vehicles can deploy. And, um, you know, commerce can't stop. Uh, Chris's vehicles can't stop, you know, you can't buy them and then wait for charging infrastructure. So also outside of just getting the vehicle technologies in, um, the refueling technologies for this whole class of vehicles has to go in first. Thanks, Bill. And thanks, Alberts, off the bat. Um, so, so just a couple more questions before we turn it over to, to an update on the, the SURF effort. Um, Susan, then Mike. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I want to commend the speakers. I, I think the uh, collaboration and everything that you've done to, to carry out this vision is the kind of thing that we really need. But what I am going to try to say right now is that there needs to be some kind of really big regional planner that looks closely at the two federal, federal roads that are not working properly coming into Sacramento. Sacramento I-5 makes a 90 in Woodland 
and goes right downtown because of poor decisions back in the day. I-80 is a one lane exit off of I-80. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know there's there's a we actually at our last cap luncheon we spoke about uh, the I a lot of the work happening on I-80 in in so, mainly Yolo County uh, as a big opportunity for sort of the infrastructure investments that are coming our way. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of work happening on I-5. I don't know much about that work to be completely honest, but interested in learning more for sure. I don't know if we have any experts on the line who can provide some insights into those, but. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Mike Lucan, uh, Executive Director of Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. Uh, great discussion today. Uh, thank, thanks to the panel and everyone else. Um, but maybe looking outside of the, the center of the region, uh, as, as, as Susan was, was saying, um, you know, we're in the, in the midst of, uh, of two very significant uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, the expansion of uh, the 8065 interchange, um, which is a half a billion dollar project, and the uh, the widening of, of SR65. And we're doing our darndest, uh, Eric White uh, uh, with uh, Placer, uh, Placer County APCD and, and myself to to bring these projects uh, uh, into the, uh, the present day in terms of regional charging facilities uh, and, and other, you know, CAPTI compliant uh, aspects. And so uh, the question I guess I have, and it was sort of answered by some of the responses, is we are, are planning uh, a very large regional charging facility as part of the interchange project and uh, focusing on, on light to medium duty trucks and working with our uh, electric service provider, uh, Roseville Electric in the area, which is a very forward thinking uh, public utility like SMUD. And uh, I just, um, uh, you know, we, we, we're fortunate to have, you know, right in the neighborhood too, the, the regional Tesla dealership, and they have a large uh, 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 charging facility there already in place. But um, any recommendations for, for us as we, we plan, uh, you know, this, this, uh, addition to the uh, the interchange project. Um, we uh, certainly want it to be an asset to the entire region. We have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of large users with a FedEx facility, a UPS, a Save Mart's distribution facility, Ace Hardware's regional distribution facility, to name many, many others uh, that are in that corridor. Any advice to us uh, as we are, are planning this regional charging facility uh, uh, up near the interchange? Um, it's also a, a, a transit hub for us as well, um, uh, and, and is served by uh, major uh, transmission lines uh, that uh, that Roseville Electric has in place already. So it's uh, it's sort of an ideal spot. But I just you know, uh, uh, as we're on this call, any any advice that the the panel can offer us? Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in there. Um, you know, in the planning and the forward thought research for these large charging plazas really is at a different wig. Um, you know, I can tell you is most of them at a facility level, we're looking to start at about 3.5 megawatts. But when we get built out to like real truck charging and a lot of vehicles, um, growth potential to almost be 10 times larger than that. So when you're looking really at what the potential is, you know, we talk about these large regional uh, medium heavy duty and, and light duty joint charging plazas like a big truck stop, right? Uh, probably being upwards of 35 or 40 megawatts. Now for most of the people on the, the line here, that doesn't mean much, but to a utility, that's one or two substations. Uh, a substation is like $10 million by itself and is probably three years to uh, plan and construct. So those don't happen overnight. And, you know, when you're talking to Roseville Electric and, and I talk to those folks too as well, really need to be thinking about that, you know, um, close to transmission lines is great. 
Um, and, you know, I've been involved in various forward planning and, and Roseville has been engaged in some of those with regards to uh, what we call regional. Um, the other thing that I'll just share with you when we get into that type of transportation, just having, this is why regional planning is so important. Just having one station doesn't really do much. We need to get a whole network going. Um, that way, you know, um, you can actually go out of, you know, um, from city to city, uh, from county to county. Um, you know, how are you going to get up to Reading, um, you know, on that type of stuff for goods movement in and out of the ports of uh, Oakland? So anyhow, we, we do need to think about these things regionally. That's a lot of power, um, you know, on the utility side. We, we do do 20, 30-year plans. So those are the things we need to start looking at jointly now. Um, and honestly, even jointly utilities. I mean, if we're going to be putting regional charging up I-80, you know, that's literally a SMUD, Roseville, and PG&E uh, type endeavor. Uh, I just want to add in, and I completely agree with everything Bill said, and I, I do think that sometimes these large um, charging facilities, it's a good opportunity for public-private partnerships, because there's a lot of, of private venture in this space, and, and Mike, happy to take the conversation offline and, and introduce you to a few folks that are in this space as well, um, that can work with you and the utilities to, to kind of get that up and running. Ray, thank you. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, Bill. Uh, you answered my question and, and looking forward to uh, potentially following up with both of you and, and others on the on the call. So. Yeah, I appreciate that question. So now I'd like to actually shift over and invite Valley Visions Manager of Research and Policy, Isa Avancenia, to join us. She'll speak briefly about the Community Economic Resilience Fund, or SURF, uh, that you have heard about at a previous CAP luncheon. Uh, but it's really an important new opportunity from the state of California to build regional economic and environmental resilience. So Issa is going to share an update with us, and then we'll we'll have some discussion after. Go ahead, Issa. Thanks, Adrian, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm going to start by pulling up my screen share here. Okay, Adrian, are you seeing that okay? Yeah, it looks great. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Okay, so uh, again, really happy uh, to be here with you all today. Um, so, you know, in the first half of this uh, CAP luncheon, uh, we heard from Rafe and Chris and Bill um, about some of the federal investment opportunities that are coming down the pipeline. Um, now we're transitioning over to talking about one of the uh, major investment opportunities that is being administered by the state of California. Um, that, it, that is also very closely related to uh, a lot of the work that you all are doing. Um, I'll start with a very uh, brief recap of some of the basics of the Community Economic Resilience Fund or SURF program. Um, I think many of you are um, already aware of what SURF is, but I think it's always helpful uh, in a conversation to get back to the basics or start off with the basics. Um, then I'll move on to talking a little bit about some of the more recent updates happening in our region with respect to the SURF. Um, we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, and then I believe Adrian and I are going to uh, facilitate a discussion with you all um, and you know, give everyone the opportunity to, to weigh in with any thoughts that they may have um, around uh, this program. Okay, so uh, the SURF uh, is a one-time use of American Rescue Plan Act funds um, that, will be, uh, that will distribute about $600 billion in a competitive process to regions across California. So while this grant is being administered by the state of California, the original source of the funds um, is federal ARPA funds. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, major pillars of the SURF program. So the ultimate vision of SURF is to deliver a sustainable and, equi uh, and equitable recovery from the economic distress brought about by COVID-19 by creating high quality accessible jobs in environmentally sustainable industries. Um, and there are a couple of things that I really wanna highlight. Uh, the first is that what we can see from these pillars is that the SURF is really trying to align workforce goals with carbon emission reduction goals and is viewing carbon emission reduction goals as economic opportunities for the regions throughout California. 
Um, the second thing I want to highlight is that uh, when SURF talks about uh, recovery or economic recovery, you know, it's not just talking about that sort of immediate bounce back from the COVID-19 economic, uh, economic distress. Um, it's also really focused on that long-term recovery. So the intent of this program is to have that catalytic transformative investment or effect rather on our economy in line with those uh, workforce and low carbon uh, priorities that I mentioned. Another important pillar of the SURF is that it seeks um, a meaningfully inclusive regional planning process. So there is recognition by the SURF program that um, there are many communities and many, uh, or many communities have needs that have um, typically been left out of the more traditional economic planning processes. So the SURF really emphasizes the need to make this process uh, really meaningfully inclusive to, to have more equitable outcomes um, from it. Um, another important pillar of the surf is that, um, sorry about the dogs in the background there. Um, finally, the surf program emphasizes the need to align and leverage all the different investments uh, coming down the pipeline. So you heard earlier about the federal investments that are coming down. Um, there are also other state investment opportunities coming down, philanthropic and private sector investments. So um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done around aligning all these different efforts and making sure they're, they're working in sync together. Uh, very briefly, as I said earlier, um, the SURF program divides the state of California into 13 different regions. This map uh, is just showing that uh, and zooming into our greater Sacramento region um, for the SURF includes eight different counties. So those are the counties of Calusa, El Dorado, Placer, Sacramento, uh, Nevada, Sutter, Yolo, and Yuba. So those are the eight counties that are making up our um, Sacramento surf region. Uh, so the surf program is being implemented in, or sorry, is being administered in two different phases. The first is the planning phase. And under the planning phase, um, every region that submits, or each region that submits a qualified application um, from what we gather from their draft guidelines, it's an automatic $5 million to that region to undergo this planning process. Um, and the planning process is really about um, establishing these regional inclusive planning tables um, to result in a holistic strategy and a recommended series of investments. And that takes us to the second phase, which is the implementation phase. That is, um, uh, for the dollars in the implementation phase, that's going to be a, a competitive process where you know each region is going to um, sort of have to justify the amount that they're asking for from that remaining pot of money. Um, funds, uh, the, the objective of the implementation or the implementation phase is meant to fund projects in localities across the regions based on um, regional plans developed and criteria outlined in that planning phase. Um, but the draft guidelines uh, that we've gotten from the surf state leadership team um, also provide some language around what they call early implementation pilot projects. So the SURF program recognizes that um, there are some regions that may have already undergone some economic development processes that are relevant to the SURF. Um, and so they don't give too many details on this yet, but they essentially say that if you have some projects or programs that have already been identified in an economic development process to being uh, crucial for your region, there is going to be an opportunity to, to, um, to uh, apply for funding for those projects, and then the other projects coming from obviously the outcome of that first planning phase. Uh, very briefly, uh, just an update to let everyone know where we are on the, safe, the state surf timeline. Um, so draft guidelines for the planning phase were put out last December. Um, and the state team invited um, public comment for those plans um, that was uh, submitted by, by the different regions or different entities um, back in January. Um, the original plan was to have the solicitation and the final guidelines put out in February. Uh, that's been delayed. Um, from what we know, the state received um, really a lot from the public comment and um, are really taking their time to sort of make sure that's all factored in. So what we're hearing now is that that uh, solicitation and guidelines um, are not going to come out until April. Um, so obviously affecting all these, these dates, it's about a two month delay, um, which really is not, you know, not a negative thing. This is an unprecedented amount of money. It's a um, very ambitious program. You know, we want the state to be thinking very uh, deliberately and being very thoughtful about you know, how we go about distributing this money across the state. Uh, so some uh, quick regional updates or updates on what is happening uh, in our region specifically around the surf. 
Um, so I always like to mention or call out um, a couple of, um, I call them regional assets um, in the Sacramento region that make our region or position our region to be very competitive for um, receiving these SURF funds. Uh, the first one is our uh, prosperity strategy, which is our regional comprehensive economic development strategy. Uh, and the second thing is just the you know, array of existing opportunities we have across key sectors, a lot of which you know, some of you talked about um, the first hour of this meeting. Um, the one thing I really want to emphasize here is, so the SURF program guidelines make it a point of talking about how, hey, if you're a region and you've got some economic development processes or products already in place, like, for example, a comprehensive economic development strategy, hold on to that, don't throw that out, but the objective is going to be to leverage and expand on those. So um, with, for example, our prosperity strategy here, um, that's just sort of one starting piece of the puzzle. Our region is going to have to do a lot of work around building a much larger, more inclusive table and really designing a process for both the planning and implementation phase um, where we have diverse communities coming together who can co-own and advance these solutions. So um, while it is um, an asset that helps to make us competitive, again, it's sort of just one of those starting blocks and we're really gonna have to build up the, that process from there. Um, some actions that are being taken in our region. Um, so Valley Vision is actively planning and beginning to build partnerships to advance an application for our region for uh, the planning phase. Um, I wanna emphasize here that um, we're in sort of the very early days of this. You know, As I said earlier, all we've seen at this point from the state are the draft guidelines for the planning implement implementation. Those draft guidelines gave us some good ideas about, uh, gave us um, an idea of what the program entails, but still a lot of unanswered questions. And again, we're not going to get those final guidelines for that solicitation until April. Um, so we really are in the very early stages of mobilizing around this. And a lot of our effort currently is really focused on just outreach and engagement to inform about the opportunity and gain a sense of priority and interest in the SURF program. Um, we've also been engaging or communicating with lead state agencies and advocating for our region's needs with these state agencies. Um, and we're also building a listserv of interested parties, people who are interested in this and want to keep hearing about it and want to stay engaged in, in this process. Uh, and the last slide I'll share a little bit uh, shortly after this is um, got a link to a survey and a QR code that um, you can scan or go into to Give, provide your contact information, answer some basic questions to make sure that you are sort of on our uh, list and we're able to continue staying engaged with you um, throughout this process. Um, Adrian, how are we want to do a quick time check with you? Um, I've got a couple of slides to talk very briefly about the public comment we put in, um, or would you rather we just sort of shift over to the discussion portion? Um, no. Feeling? Why don't you go quickly through the last couple okay. of slides? All right, great. Um, so as I mentioned, public comment for the SURF draft planning phase guidelines, uh, lots of words, <laughs> were due uh, back in uh, January. Um, so the Prosperity Partners, which is Valley Vision, together with SACOG, the Sacramento Metro Chamber, the Sacramento Asian Chamber, and the Greater Sacramento Economic Council, um, and SMUD, who has been a, a constant and really crucial support to our prosperity strategy, um, since we started that whole process a few years ago. So we together submitted um, public comment in response to the draft guidelines. Um, so these next couple of slides are just outlining um, some of the things we said in that public comment and really just sort of highlighting um, what were some of the big question marks still in our mind, um, some of the things we need uh, the state's guidance on still for the SURF program. Um, so some of the big buckets here, um, we expressed that we needed further guidance from the state on several things. One of them was uh, on, or one of the big ones was on uh, any unmovable federal prescriptions, reporting requirements, or accountability measures. So as I mentioned earlier, even though this program is being administered by the state of California, the um, source of the funds are ARPA funds, so a federal funding source, which means that oftentimes with this federal money, there are um, prescriptions that are attached to it that sort of limit the way that you can use those funds. And we had, didn't have any details on that in the draft guidelines. So um, we um, wanted to seek some clarity from the state on what, what those might look like. Um, we also needed more guidance on just criteria for designating the different roles identified in the draft planning phase guidelines. Um, 
the guidelines uh, list out different roles, such as you know a convener, a coordinator, a fiscal agent, um, with not a ton of detail about what are the criteria for those different roles, what are the expectations. So seeking more detail around that. Um, and finally, the specific way that the planning and implementation phases are going to be bridged. Um, so you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's two phases: it's planning and implementation, and um, you know, in theory, everything that comes out of the planning phase will then inform what happens at the implementation phase. Um, but as I said, um, the implementation phase also leaves room for what they're calling early implementation pilot projects, which are projects that maybe a region has already identified as being critical to economic success in their region. So really just seeking guidance from the state on what, what does that look like? How do those um, two phases uh, intersect or relate to each other? Or what does that look like, that space of time between those two phases? Uh, and finally, we also said in our public comment, just highlighted the need for um, some things that we think were missing from the draft guidelines. Um, one really critical one was uh, we highlighted that there has to be, that there is a need for flexibility in the use of funds. This ties back to what I said earlier about um, the likelihood that there will be some federal prescriptions attached to this grant. Um, you know, in order to really meaningfully engage with the communities that the SURF program seeks to priority, prioritize, there has to be some flexibility in how we use this funding. And so we um, emphasize that to the state. Um, we also emphasize the need for a results-based framework that reflects the need for both near-term and long-term projects for each region's recovery and transition strategy. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the SURF program highlights the importance of both things, again, recovery and transition. Um, and so we're seeking sort of um, a framework for what it you know, what the impact or results of that are, are supposed to look like as we're doing our planning and our implementation. Uh, and finally, the need for some technical assistance um, in setting up the engagement and government structures needed to build out these planning tables. Um, this is a process that is going to involve a lot of different people, as it should. Um, it's going to be a very complex um, uh, engagement and governance process. And so we're really seeking some guidance from the state on, um, you know, giving us some technical assistance on how to navigate that or for, for all the regions really on how, how they can navigate this. Um, and finally, here's the uh, slide I mentioned. Um, I, Adrian, I believe the materials for this are also going to be sent out. So um, if you're not able to yeah. capture this now, great. So if you're not able to capture this now, you can, um, this PowerPoint will be sent out with everything else. Um, if you attended the information session that Valley Vision hosted back in November, this is the same survey. So if you've already filled it out then, you don't need to fill it out again. Um, it's a very quick survey, take you probably like a couple of minutes. So if you're not sure if you filled it out or not, I'd encourage you to also fill it out again. You can either go to that link or scan the QR code. Um, and then I also put my email address at the bottom. We're really interested in staying um, very closely engaged with folks on the SURF program. So. Uh, if you would like to, you know, talk to us directly to learn a little bit more or, you know, figure out ways that we can continue to work together moving forward, please don't hesitate to reach out to my email address there um, or to Adrian and he'll, he'll connect you with me as well. Thanks, Isa. And by the way, yeah. I just, so yeah, th this information yeah. will be sent out uh, in follow-up. And by the way, I, I held my phone up to your QR code and it worked. It went right to the, the URL. So Great. that's just wonderful. <laughs> that's um, always a gamble until someone like tests yeah. it out in real time. Yeah. So Gracie, it looks like you have your hand up. I'm a little slow. Sorry. It's work day. Um, I, I'm Gracie Phillips and I'm from the Oak Park Neighborhood Association, but speaking as a concerned resident, um, I just want to, I want to make sure that we are aware of what's what's happening. This sounds like a really good plan. It sounds like we're trying to make change that's going to make life somewhat easier for others. I just want to make sure that we're focusing on the, you know, the humanity that's going to be affected by this. And specifically, I hear about creating jobs. That's fantastic. Um, but we need to, what are we doing to make sure that we build trust in these, these communities? I've heard them referred to as under-resourced. I prefer to refer to them as marginalized, but um, I know public, public inquiry gives us only so much because only so many people show up. Um, so I'm just curious if there's any more specific, um, specific communication devices that we're using to talk to marginalized communities about what's coming. Because we all know it's coming, but do the people who are actually 
you know, on the ground understand what's coming. And that's for anybody to answer. Um, thank you, Gracie. That's a really, really good question. Um, you know, as I said, um, language in the SURF program indicates that this is a really big priority for the program, but it's one thing for that to be stated in the guidelines and another, you know, when it's like, okay, but how do we actually do this and how do we actually implement that in a meaningful way? Um, and again, it, it's, it's going to be this process of like, how do we not do it the exact same way we've done it before, right? We have to do this in a different way for, for this to have a meaningful impact. And I think that's going to be, um, you know, frankly, a complex process. And it's something we're all going to have to get together and figure out and make sure we're really having that concrete engagement. Um, concretely, something, so, you know, for example, I mentioned, you know, one of the concerns that we have um, is that because the source of the money is federal, there are often a lot of restrictions around the federal funding, what you can and can't spend for. That's one of the things we have been sort of saying since the beginning, and not just us, but a lot of other um, you know, organizations or jurisdictions that are getting involved here or entities that are getting involved in this um, is really to say, hey, we need flexibility in the ways we use that funding um, because best practices and community engagement indicate that you need to be able to think about things like, you know, how are you compensating folks for their time? Or how are you incentivizing folks for their time? Or how are you creating you know, structures where people are really able, the people you actually want to engage with are really able to come forward and participate in a meaningful way. Um, so that's one of the things we're really, um, you know, keeping our focus on and we're really not sure how that's going to shake out. Again, you know, we sort of put that in our public comment and have been having constant conversations around it, but uh, still unclear what the outcome of that will be. Um, and yeah, really just sort of, you know, it's very early stages in the process, but our hope is that um, whatever process we figure out for that planning, you know, the governance and engagement in that planning and implementation phase, it's a co-owned process and there is, um, you know, good representation from these marginalized communities, again, highlighted as a priority in the program. What does that mean? How do we get those folks involved? Um, but definitely something that's really um, front of mind for us. Um, and I know that question was addressed to sort of any folks who want to chime in, so. I'll stop there in case anyone thank wants you. to add. Thank you, though. I, I appreciate yeah. your, your explanation for that because I yeah. just, you know, we've been doing, this has been happening for a long time and it's, we have to find a better way to do it. And, Absolutely. you know, yeah. hopefully we're looking at other models and seeing that, you know, what, what went wrong and what quite wasn't working right. So I appreciate right. your answer, Missy. Yeah, I, I might just add to that before calling on Chris. I, you know, just want to second what Issa said about needing funding flexibility. Some federal programs are, you know, just frankly, absolute dinosaurs when it comes to being able to spend specific pots of money. Like they don't let you pay community members to come to meetings, you know, and if we're trying to build an inclusive table for this process, have labor at the, at the table, have business, have environmental justice folks, have others, have government, all working on this collaborative process, we're going to need to pay community to come out. And so we need to know how that federal money can be used. And of course, you know, we've provided recommendations, but that's the best we can do at this point. So yeah. hopefully we learn more. Federal covenants are an issue. So a matter of, obviously we're trying to change the federal government in order to open their minds about how we get people involved is, you know, I know it's a monumental task. So I do understand that. Thanks, Adrian. For sure. Chris? Okay, so I'm gonna speak in my role of not Frontier Energy, but Yolo County resident. Uh, and commissioner and say, you know, thanks for leading this. It's super important that we have a region. I think you guys have a big challenge in the fact that our this region is so large and so diverse. Mm -hmm. And along with Lavinia's comments about ensuring that we're, we're uh, pulling every voice in, that voice has to include Tahoe Truckee and Elk Grove and the farmers in Yellow County and not just SEC Metro Chamber of Commerce, who represents just a sliver of the businesses. So, uh, you know, I want to encourage you to reach out and make sure you're talking to all of the other chambers, um, Davis, West Sacramento, uh, Elk Grove, every Natomas, and hearing them, and let's make sure that we are not coming up with a plan that is so urban-centric, it doesn't consider the folks who, who have bus service yes. or... You know, uh, three of our counties are agricultural trusts, and there will be no more development outside of city boundaries. And how do we tackle all of those things? And three of those counties or four of those counties 
have no disadvantaged areas because they are so rural. There aren't enough people to have bad pollution. So, so, <clears throat> so I want to say, remember those of us who don't live in downtown Sacramento. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, really, really appreciate those those comments. Um, yeah, and you're absolutely right. You know, I think really in just sort of the very early stages of this, um, when they were first talking about how to divide up the regions, I feel like that was the collective reaction of everybody involved, not just in Sacramento, but, you know, I pulled up that map earlier. Um, you look at the way that other regions are divided as well, and it's really, you know, that initial reaction from everybody was really like, oh my goodness, like how you have such a range of, and the program emphasizes the need for really like specific targeted action that is responsive to every, you know, county, city, every community's need. But how are you doing that when you're lumping together all these different counties with like vastly different economies? That That is really uh, a challenge. And I appreciate your comments about, you know, it's not just Sacramento or central Sacramento, but it's also making sure that we um, you know, reach out to, to the other jurisdictions involved. Um, you know, I think Sacramento, we're also very used to, you know, in, in a lot of processes we have, we're used to operating on that uh, six county footprint, right? Like our SAPOG jurisdiction lines up with that six county footprint, but it's not the six county footprint for this. It's our eight counties, it uh, includes Calusa and Nevada. Um, we, uh, you know, since uh, sort of the earlier days of this process, we've been uh, working really closely with our uh, partners over at Tahoe through the Tahoe, uh, Tahoe Prosperity Center and also um, with the Sierra Business Council and been really close conversations with them to talk about, you know, how are we going to do this where we put forward a competitive application, but that is being really respectful and responsive of, you know, the economic development processes that are happening in the different counties. Because again, very varied economies when you, you know, look at all of them and put them all together. So um, yes, really appreciate those comments, Chris. And that's definitely something that we are um, you know, continuing to be mindful of and we'll, we'll keep front of mind. Thank you. And at this point, you know, we're welcoming questions for also our panelists from the first session too, yeah. Rafe, Chris, and Bill. So if there are things, because we're talking at this point about regional coordination or investments, we're both state and federal. So if there are things that you think are relevant to not only what Issa talked about, but also what Rafe, Chris, and Bill talked about, you know, that's fair game too. Um, I know I have some questions that are kind of about that holistic, that, that sort of holistic thing. So go to Alberto next and please raise your hand if you have a question. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I think that the, the tendency for us to ask Issa questions about the surface because that is much more tangible and immediate, right? The program is here. I think the federal programs uh, or opportunities that we discuss is, is in my mind a little more nebulous because things are still not well shaped. But anyways, my question for you, Isa, is this. I know that you said we are very early in the process and you're anticipating first a planning grant and then to identify the projects. But you and those of you leading the charge here, you must have thought, further ahead. Can you give us some examples or, or one example of the type of project that you think uh, could be implemented with this program? I'm, I'm still trying to put together uh, in my mind what type of project could actually be implemented with this, with this uh, program. And maybe you guys have some ideas that you could share for, uh, with us. Yeah, thank you for that question, Alberto. Um, yeah, like I said, you know, sort of very early in the process and not a ton of specific guidance from the state at this point. You know, again, um, they do emphasize that those dual pillars of, you know, low carbon, uh, the low carbon economy and also workforce. Um, so, you know, thinking about the sorts of things that might be included in this, you know, one of the things that comes to my mind are, you know, efforts around clean mobility. You know, a lot of the stuff you folks were talking about early on at the first half of the meeting, you know, I think, um, and, and I forget who it was who was speaking to this, but, you know, someone said there's like a workforce gap there, right? That's another like really clear issue. When you talk about EV, there's that workforce gap that needs to be filled. Um, and so, you know, thinking about things like that, I think that whole body of clean future mobility, um, to my mind, um, would slot really well into this. Again, it's sort of hard to say very specifically, you know, what those, you know, projects are. And we certainly don't want to sort of put ourselves in the position of being like, we are the, you know, people who are going to be deciding this. That's not the case at all. This has to be like a co-owned process throughout the region 
And we have to all figure out together what is the process we're going to put in place to identify those priorities, make those decision, uh, decisions, and really make sure we're, you know, including the folks who have to be included. But um, yeah, but, you know, I think, you know, I think part of why it was so great to combine these two conversations is, again, it's like a demonstration of how closely these things are really going to overlap. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that whole space of, you know, clean future mobility, I think that, to my mind, at least falls really squarely into this. But again, it's, it's one of those things where we're going to have to um, have to see. And, and I, uh, Adrian, I don't know if you want to jump in. I know uh, Adrian might have some thoughts on this as well. Well, I, I'll just say, you know, as a as sort of a neighborhood person myself, I mean, we're all neighborhood people, we all live somewhere, but um, also very interested in sort of what what not top down ideas can come can come Absolutely. about via just yeah. like neighborhood projects, community scale stuff that, that really interests me. And I think there's some yeah. things going on in, you know, where Oak Park, where I live and, and elsewhere right. and, you know, El Dorado, uh, you know, all sorts of places. So um, just a thought. Um, so I, I had a quick question before going to Mark, uh, and this is kind of a little bit more for Rafe, Chris, and Bill, but also I think Isa. So um, as part of Valley Vision, as part of our cap to cap federal advocacy planning each year, um, we, we had a meeting not, a, not long ago where we were talking about what to prioritize, and we were talking about the, the Build Back Better bill, which was sort of that bigger, you know, we, we've talked about the infrastructure package, that's passed. But there was also this Build Back Better social spending slash climate package that was really big, that was being advanced and really didn't really go anywhere. Uh, and so we were hearing in a meeting earlier this week that that bill or the components of Build Back Better are likely to be basically broken out uh, into a whole bunch of different things. Um, so one way of thinking about that is like they're being sold for parts, you know, the car is being sold for parts, and those things are going to be sort of advanced independently. Uh, and so question for Rafe, Chris, and Bill, what pieces of the Build Back Better package that is now sort of going to be going to be a whole bunch of different things, what pieces of those should we be thinking about in terms of like federal advocacy for this year? Um, it, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that. To be honest, I, I don't have an, an uh, Chris, I don't know if you wanted to chime in. I don't have an initial gut reaction to it. Yeah, I mean, what I'll just add is obviously the transportation was really considered taken care of in the infrastructure law. So build back better, hearing the same thing, it's really the social programs, um, but breaking it into pieces. And that's kind of why we've seen these various CRs through the government um, and not getting a, a, a spending bill passed yet this year. So um, we'll see if that works. That, that process, but yeah, the various components of it, I'll, I'll leave that to you guys, sorry. Yeah, I'll chime in. I mean, um, to what Chris said, I mean, most of the stuff outside of just light duty vehicle incentives were, were covered in the, in the infrastructure bill. Um, you know, you gotta look at different parts of that. I mean, the EV infrastructure, um, gets highlighted a lot. It came through in like a $7.5 billion chunk of which 5 billion is headed to the states on what they call formula grants and 2.5 is gonna go for um, uh, interstate charging. But, you know, there's different pots of money that show up in uh, there for things like the transit buses out of a uh, federal transit administration. But it's interesting, a lot of that money is all flowing through the transportation departments. Um, but, you know, the other one we shouldn't overlook. Okay, so California's share of the $5 million um, or $5 billion uh, EV charging is somewhere between, I, I've heard, $384 million up to $500 million. The state of California and the governor is proposing essentially almost $10 billion in funding. So everybody's focused on the feds, but we've got more money in the state and in the state budget plans right now, uh, way more. And, you know, we should really also be paying a lot of attention to the California Energy Commission and uh, our own in-state resources right now. So... You, know, you asked me what we should be focused on and in, in kind of at that federal side, um, you know, don't lose 
track of what we've got, you know, and, and oh, by the way, you know, we only have to um, compete with LA, right? You know, we don't have to compete with the whole rest of the country um, uh, with regards to, you know, some of these opportunities that could be at hand. Thanks for that. One more question, and then I'm going to go to Mark. Um, so I know as part of the, the infrastructure bill that has been passed, uh, I've heard a lot about, you know, there's all those different buckets in there. And we, we, again, talked about those buckets at our last CAP luncheon. Uh, there's a recording available for those who weren't able to make it. But those, as part of those buckets, I've heard people say, we need to take a broad view of, of infrastructure. Like when I think of infrastructure, I think of bridges and highways, but I've heard people say, and maybe EV stuff, but I've heard people say, we need to take a broad view to secure some of those investments. So I'm curious, like what are examples of a broad view of infrastructure that could be a project funded by the infrastructure bill. Um, is that something we're thinking about or is it, or, or I mean, we, we've heard about EVs. I'm just trying to think about like other things that are, that are, yeah, like I'm, I'm seeing Jessica's comment, trees, trees are infrastructure. <laughs> I've heard about infrastructure in, you know, uh, in terms of forest management, you know, wildfire prevention infrastructure. I'm just wondering if folks have thought about some non-traditional uh, infrastructure. I always like to think of the infrastructure piece, and I think this is why it, it plays so well with having multiple agencies. And I'll, I'll use climate adaptation as a as a kind of a, a gateway for this. Is is every project can have a climate adaptation component to it, right? The materials that you use, the things that you're doing, where you're placing it putting things like street trees and other infrastructure in that place can tie into a climate, you know, a climate adaptation piece. So what are the other components <clears throat> that can be done as we're thinking of, you know, as SACOG's thinking about, you know, building roads or building projects. I think, you know, Mike thinking about, you know, their, their interchange with 80 and 65 and, and building a truck charging plaza. Where are those opportunities to pull in pieces of it? So, you know, as we're thinking about, um, you know, building infrastructure, do you, do you place charging infrastructure? Are there opportunities to do things like street trees or use different pavement materials? How does it play into transit and how do you serve transit better for that? I think it's, I think it's just thinking about it holistically and, and that becomes kind of that, that broader uh, transportation package instead of just doing it piecemeal to say, we're going to build this road and then five years later, you know, think about how you build active transportation and street trees into it. You need to think about it from a, uh, from a full mobility perspective. Thanks, I appreciate that. All right, Mark. You got a question for us, Mark? You're muted. There, okay, now? Better? Yep, you got 30 seconds. What's your question? Okay. Um, thinking about, well, if you put up the solar, you know, check, check the chat because I, I didn't think I'd have this opportunity. So uh, solar uh, canopies as well as rooftop solar completely covering parking lots and driveways and more, sometimes even streets. Um, in the Central Valley, in terms of holistic thinking and climate adaptation, that prevents the sun from hitting the ground. You actually have everything under shade, which reduces the amount of refrigeration you need in the trucks and also re reduces the amount of um, heat you're, you're giving to the people. Also, you might think of ultra high performance concrete from Europe. Uh, there's a North American distributor that's a friend of mine uh, which is many times stronger and longer lasting than regular pavement. Um, you could be thinking of uh, combine of basically working for fleets. Um, work, you know, I'm focused on fleets, and I'd like to talk to people, um, and uh, I'd like to uh, actually be collaborating with people because we're looking at having a breakthrough in solar and probably a breakthrough in batteries within two years and there's several other things to go with that. One other piece would be, uh, think about group rapid transit, bi-directional group rapid transit as, spine, as ribs on the high-speed rail spine, and also as ribs on the freeways as spines. 
uh, in terms of a systematic approach to getting people out of their cars. And above the group rapid transit, you could have a stack of guideways for bicycles, fast and slow bicycles, and for pedestrians and for miscellaneous mobility devices, and a solar canopy above that, providing charging for the group rapid transit. That's Thank it for you, now. I, I appreciate it. I love those ideas, and, and folks can find you in the chat. That's awesome. Thank you. So with that, really, really do appreciate our speakers. Um, I wanted to make sure that folks had a way. So Isa, I know you shared your screen and your contact information. So if folks have questions about SURF, they can, they can access you there. And I know we'll be sending out your info again on Monday. Um, Rafe, Chris, and Bill, and or Bill, what's the best way for folks, if, if they have ideas or questions about the, the work that you guys have been doing, who, who's, who's taken on the point person role <laughs> between the, the four agencies? <laughs> I don't know if there's a point person necessarily, but you, you can reach out to each one of us individually. We're always happy to chat. And okay. let me just, just add before we move on on the federal um, program, because we didn't get too into it. That, you know, a lot of the guidance will be coming for these discretionary grant programs. I did put in the chat, there's the, the, the new law does create a few new programs. And so it's interesting to see what they what kind of guidance will be coming out. And one that they've talked about quite a bit is the mega um, projects program. And so that's really ones that connect regions and so forth. And so I just put that kind of initial guidance of what they're looking for for project evaluation in the chat, but um, watch for more NOFO. I mean, we're, we're, we should see low no bus bus facility, those traditional grant programs coming out too, so. Excellent, thank you for that. So I have a couple of announcements before we call it. Um, just want to first thank you all for attending our luncheon today. It was a really insightful conversation. Thanks to Valley Vision's Brittany Johnson and Issa Avancenia. Um, and of course, to our lineup of speakers and of course, to the Clean Air Partners' generous contributors for sponsoring the luncheon. Just wanted to plug a couple of things. The first is the Sacramento Metro Chamber's Cap to Cap program. Uh, it's happening April 30th through May 4th, 2022. This is really the, the preeminent federal advocacy opportunity that our region engages in each year. Um, and Valley Vision manages the air quality team uh, and there are 11 other uh, issue-based teams that go to DC and advocate for our region uh, each year. So really encourage you to get involved in that. And I'm gonna paste a link in the chat for you. Um, so come join us, come join the air quality team, come to DC with us, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, and then tomorrow, uh, Valley Vision and its partners, Civic Thread, Breathe California, and Green Tech are hosting an air quality design challenge um, with resources from both the California Air Resources Board and SMUD. And the intent is to help residents of North Sacramento and Oak Park design solutions to their air quality challenges. It's part of our uh, Sacramento Neighborhoods Activ Activating on Air Quality project to advance environmental justice in these neighborhoods. Um, we've been notified actually by CARB recently that our latest proposal to continue this work will be fully funded. So we're really excited about that. Um, that project will start April 1st, hopefully, um, and allow us to expand our work in these neighborhoods, pilot an on-the-ground emissions reduction program, and also pilot a $100,000 participatory budgeting framework, which allows residents to determine how our budget gets spent. So really, really excited about that. Um, and if you guys want uh, to check that out. Really, it's it's a really intended for North Sac and Oak Park residents, but if, if you would describe yourself as such, please register and, and come join us tomorrow. Uh, we are paying folks uh, $150 to attend and $50 for lunch additionally. So um, that's cool. And then lastly, we're also hiring at Valley Vision. And we have two really great positions. I just pasted them in the chat. Um, they're both due next week. So please, if you know good people, share them, share these positions with them. One is a project leader for digital equity and inclusion. This is a new position at Valley Vision because of our expanding sort of work at the intersection of broadband and digital equity and workforce development. And then the other job is actually someone you might end up seeing on a cap luncheon. That's a project associate for the clean economy portfolio. That person would work directly with me on the Cleaner Air Partnership and our other uh, clean air projects. So if you know someone who you think would be great, you know, passionate about the environment, would love to work at Valley Vision, love to, who I'd love to work with, um, please shoot um, them a, shoot them the job position. So again, two jobs, 
They're both open through next week. Um, get on it if you know some good people, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so now the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to share the evaluation form in the chat. So I uh, really just want to get your take on additional um, topics to explore for these cap luncheons. So hit that link. Let us know how we did. Um, really do appreciate the feedback. We do look at it and share it with our speakers and, and, and internally as well. Um, one question in there is about how comfortable you might be doing an in-person luncheon sometime in the June timeframe. So I know we don't know how things are going with in terms of the trajectory of COVID, but that is maybe a possibility that we could meet meet for a, a real in-person luncheon and actually feed you guys. We haven't fed you guys in two years. So <laughs> that was always an aspect of our old luncheons that I do miss as a food, as a food uh, fan. So lastly, a recording of this webinar will be available on Valley Vision's YouTube uh, early next week. I will email you the link. I will email you all the presentations. Um, and I hope you guys all enjoy your Friday. So thanks so much for joining us. Have a great weekend.